panel. This is the first time that we've done a session like this, but as I was telling everybody here, this is uh, in some ways how I perceive myself as a director or producer. And I wanted to bring that conversation uh, to this community because we're all about content, aren't we? As, as well as about technology. And I think we really need to talk to the people who are behind interactive story creation. Uh, and, you know, it, we could take an entire conference, I think, to deal with this topic. But uh, why don't we just get right to the, uh, the introductions? Because these are really stellar people, and they were so kind to fly from various locations <laughs> around the world. Thomas, did you fly in from London? No, LA. LA? LA? All right. I thought you were in London. Okay, so we have Thomas Bensky, who's the CEO of Pulse Films. I'll just quickly. Jason Truco, who's an independent director in LA and uh, Toronto. Yvette Vargas, who's from LA, who's also a director, producer, digital content creator of all kinds. And we have Mark Smolowitz, who is a, a director, an Oscar-nominated producer. And uh, not that you guys aren't uh, uh, worthy of that Oscar, but that's just what happened this time. You guys, these guys have produced some really fantastic projects. And I wanted to ask them, you know, what that process is, the kind of stresses they have to deal with, the challenges, where they're taking their vision to create interactive stories, because without you, we, we have nothing to work on in this community, right? So I think we're going to begin uh, first, just to so people understand who you are with Thomas, and just to say something a little bit about yourself, and then we'll show and real so you see the breadth of what all of these people have done. So hi, I'm Thomas, sorry for the accent. Um, so I, I run a company called Pulse, and we are an integrated production company working across uh, film, television, advertising, music, and obviously um, digital platforms. And I guess our unique approach is the fact that we put talent at the core of everything that we do. And um, the reason I set up the company the way I did was to try and embrace the kind of fragmented landscape and try to kind of really encourage talent to embrace that from fragmented landscape. So I guess we'll show you a little bit of what we do. Um, I think that's well, the uh, one. The, uh, one. Okay, uh, Simon, can you? Hello, I am Professor Green. Simon? This is my first day oh. on the Blackberry Live and Lost tour. And I'm currently- Simon, we need the real? Sorry. Well, one of the, uh, can we find the real? I, I'm sure he will. But one of the reasons that uh, we sought out Thomas was because they were behind a project uh, that, Bob, that was uh, Bob Dylan's uh, Rolling Stone song that went viral yep. earlier in the year. And OK, oh, they're going to show that right now. Well, this is a project that uh, was done with Interlude, which is Yoni Block, who has spoken here at the times. Critical condition. So, why don't you just oh, I'll explain the project while you're looking at it a little bit. Sorry, but we'll look at your reel in a second. Um, this project uh, was um, done with Bob Dylan and Interlude, as I said, and you can change the channel and different people sing parts of Bob Dylan's song. And it was just a really fresh approach. It reintroduced his music, but actually you really should talk about the project. I think it's interesting. I think it's, it's, it's where interactivity doesn't need to be gimmicky. It's a very simple concept where Effectively, the technology part is completely buried into the idea, and, and as you can see, it was just a question of trying to make it as real as possible. So the big challenge for us was to engage all, all of the kind of known faces of television in order to kind of really make it seem like it's that you are actually skipping through the, the television. So it's a very simple, cute idea, but it actually worked really well, and I think everyone that kind of took part of it kind of got excited to be part of the, part of the, the magic trick, I guess. And, and, and yeah, so, so for me, like, this is a good example of where a simple idea well executed can actually achieve punch way above his weight, so. Uh, actually, can we bring up his reel now, Simon, please? Like a stone. It's okay, we're I don't know where I am because I'm lost. Oops. <laughs> is that messed with it yet? Oh, there we go. No? All right, anyway. All right. We tried. You can turn this off. We thought we were going to be smooth on this, on this uh, but it was my fault. OK, so basically, tell us a little bit about Pulse and the kind of work that you do there. So, so as I was saying, I think we're we a, a content creator at, at the core of what we do. And I think 
compared to a lot of the, the other companies. Um, our, I guess, differentiating point is that we're not dictating by the infrastructure. So we don't, like, when we set up the company, I saw a lot of companies that were dictated by the medium. So if you were a television production company, you just made television. If you worked in advertising, you just made it, you just made commercials. Or in film, you just made films. And I just kind of never understood why there was a, a, a company, a production company effectively, that embraced the synergies between all of these different platforms, disciplines, and so on. So I guess the, you know, the way we build ourselves is, is, is it's a combination of specialists all under one roof that do collaborate. And I think that's when interesting multi-platform ideas can, can come through because if you segregate all those disciplines, you don't actually find the, you know, the, 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 the true collaboration and, and you can't explore different ways of telling stories. So that's kind of was the, the, the original vision and still is the original vision of Pulse. And, um, and yet we've just grown to kind of um, hopefully establish ourselves as, as, as a very unique uh, production company that embraces the models of today. So, Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll put up the link to your reel later, but if you see it on our site, uh, you'll see that they've worked with all sorts of famous people doing all kinds of interactive content. It's quite impressive, the, the breadth that uh, you've been able to Thank you. Uh, so, so Jason, this yes. is Jason Truco. Hello. And he was deeply involved with our hackathon over the last few days and mentored all the hackers and judged. And uh, he, bless you, and he is, a, uh, an interactive musical, I mean, interactive music video director, an artist, installation artist, all kinds of things. So, tell us a little about yourself, and then we'll show your your video. Yeah, I think that says it. Um, I'm an, an artist and a director, and most of what I do falls in that area. Sometimes also theater, and um, it, I think it's really like Thomas said, a, a matter of collaboration. And uh, a director is really somebody that envisions something and then works with a group of specialists to be able to make something special happen that's better than any one person could do themselves. And I think it's a real privilege to be able to work with new technologies, cinema and television, where new technology is just a blip ago. And uh, so it's a, it's always important for us to embrace technology. For me. All art is technology. Paint is a technology. Um, to be able to, to put paint up on a wall and to translate an experience or a feeling to people is, uh, or, or language is, uh, is a technology as well. So I think if we think of technology with that kind of breath, we can come up with some very interesting content. OK, can we play his creator's project, Queens of the Stone Age? He uh, directed a music video for Queens of the Stone Age. on that one. It needs to be on the big screen. Cut that off. I don't know why this is happening. All right, that's okay. All right, let's, uh, Yvette, let's talk a little bit about you. Get my trailer oh, ready, please. Wait. Oh, wait. It's actually a different piece of media than that. Uh. Well, let's wait. We'll come back to it. Oh, is this it? Is that the right one? I think that's a trailer. But I'm happy to watch. Have you watched that? All right, well, we will put all of the videos out on our site. <laughs> that wasn't it either. All right, uh, this is Yvette Vargas, who's, a, as I said, a digital content producer. Hi, uh, 
thanks for coming. Uh, yep, yeah, so my name is Yvette Vargas. I'm a writer, director, executive producer, and digital content creator. I basically came out of the womb drawing and painting, so my life has been about art forever. I went from uh, visual storytelling to writing, uh, directing. I went to NYU Tisch for, for, for directing. Um, but I've always been in the digital space in terms of you know, creating content digitally. And then, uh, and then you know, from there, I went to UCLA, for screenwriting, television, show running. Uh, so I basically have always created content across formats, all, all media formats. And then uh, actually my husband and I started our digital media production company uh, many, many years ago before like what was happening now, it was really happening. And we basically created and have been creating original content for the studios. I, I'm, I live in LA, so the studios and production companies and record labels and video game companies. Now it's a lot of apps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, several years ago, we really started focusing on creating my original content. And uh, there's one television, digital uh, television series that uh, we premiered uh, called Dark Prophet, which we're, hopefully we're going to see the trailer for. And uh, premiered at Sundance, uh, just uh, premiered uh, actually on basic cable channel as well as a Roku channel creating the app now the comic book is going to premiere at Comic-Con so it really is completely a multi-platform storytelling experience that's what uh, you know we do with the company as well as our orig original content all right can we show the dark profit trailer is that Still correct? In the state of consciousness. Right. <laughs> I've administered the maximum dosage 20 more units The visions, they're getting worse. His activity keeps climbing. Have any idea what we're do? I wrote you a song. In like what, 1.3 seconds? 1.2. Contact made, assets on the move. Crunch the binary numbers. And I think it's a set of coordinates. To where? Bucharest, Romania. Okay, the target colonel. Bring him in, breathe. That's right, sir. The number of leaks of government secrets is rising. Kill this virus. We'll find out who the hell planted it. No. Sabrina! Sabrina! <gasps> Our dog pound has been compromised. Which dog pound? The dog pound. Come on! Dark Prophet has a new song, a new message for us, and we'll be the first ones to hear it tonight! Dark Prophet, hear the warning. Dark Prophet is a sci-fi action thriller set in Los Angeles. The Dark Prophet franchise spans the full multimedia spectrum, including a web and TV series, smartphone and tablet apps, comic books, feature films, music, merchandising, and more. The Dark Prophet is Day Shepard, a musical and mathematical genius who commits himself to stopping Black Box, a secret government agency which plants covert messages in songs. If the agency is successful and Day fails his mission, these messages would put a series of events into play that could lead to World War III. Dark Prophet's sole objective is to decode these messages and to stop Black Box. Integrated with the web series is the mobile decoder and music player app. The app runs on iPad, iPhone, Android, and the web. With this app, fans can decode and encode hidden secrets into Dark Prophet songs, loops, and ringtones. These messages provide a fully immersive, interactive experience that covers virtually all forms of multimedia all over the world, allowing fans to join in Dark Prophet's efforts to stop Black Box. This is Dark Prophet. The Dark Prophet has a new song, and we'll be the first ones to hear it tonight! Thank you. Well, I have to say that's a good marketing uh, job on that video. Thanks. Um, well, I mean, that's exactly, I mean, there, we will discuss, well, we will discuss business, but uh, I mean, she's already, you know, marketing her content as a, as a multi-platform 
property. You're well known for doing documentaries and meaningful documentaries, you know, things that shake up the system, things that uh, interview people, but you have also a long history as being uh, someone in interactive content. You used to work in the ITV industry many years ago. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, you're, what you do now and um, also your interactive experience? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm Mark Smolowitz, and I'm a director, producer, and executive producer, um, largely in the independent film world. And my sort of substantial track record is in nonfiction and documentary. Um, I also work as a consultant whereby uh, their filmmakers come to me and they hire me and I help them sort of steer their projects forward at every stage of a project. So I work from the early stages of an idea all the way through production post into completion and launch and distribution. And I think that sort of, you know, what has happened over the arc of my career, and I think, you know, interestingly, the arc of my career really went from analog to digital, and I sort of rode that arc of experience in terms of my professional experience, is that I came to understand that, you know, I wasn't just making a documentary, or I wasn't just making, you know, a piece of content. I was actually developing an enterprise around a story. And so I treat each individual project as a unique enterprise. I mean, so much so that I typically form a standalone company for each project. Um, and I have a very sort of a la carte approach to customizing the, the companies and what, you know, what their goals are. And they're typically, they can be under the umbrella of my larger company, which is called 13th Gen. But, but it, each project has unique needs. And so that I sort of treat them as verticals within my work. And we kind of develop them accordingly based on a good you know, business plan to sort of developing the project. And I think in the nonfiction and documentary space, what's been really interesting, especially in the last five or so years, is this interest in what we refer to as transmedia or cross-platform storytelling. Um, yeah, there's, I do a lot of work in the social issue filmmaking milieu, and there was this idea that you could really engage audiences and funders and partners and journalists and all these different stakeholders at every stage of a project if you had the infrastructure to, if you had the infrastructure to do that. Sorry. <laughs> and... So that's what I figured out kind of early on. Um, and one of the ways that I figured that out early on was I took a break from indie film and I went and worked in inter interactive television for a few years. And I sort of did so um, at that moment in time Which when... Which company? Um, it was a company called Teletopia um, down in Santa Clara. And it was interesting because I was sort of the... I was the one content guy in a company of engineers, right? And so I very quickly became sort of like the guy that everyone looked to you know, for that sort of sweet knowledge of like, well, what are we really trying to do here? Well, we're trying to tell stories, you know? And it was in that moment where online video was just sort of scaling up into something special, um, you know, it, but it was before the sort of dominance of YouTube and Vimeo it was when there were many, many online video channels of all kinds. And my job was to figure out how to work with those companies and kind of aggregate their content into our web to TV system. So it was an early VOD, IPTV, you know, um, content provider for cable, companies and satellite companies. And that, you know, three-year experience down in Santa Clara, you know, 24-7 with the BlackBerry and, you know, overseeing, overseeing teams in a sort of, you know, 24-7 you know, environment around the world, you know, really kind of sort of opened my worldview around kind of what kind of storyteller I wanted to be in the 21st century. And then, interestingly, sort of landed back in independent film in 2008, 2009, with a much clearer purpose and vision around you know, the work that we're all describing here today. Um, interestingly, you know, there aren't a lot of us who kind of straddle that interesting space of, of opportunity and challenge between film and technology. Um, here in San Francisco, where I live and work, um, there are a few of us who are trying to make those connections and trying to, you know, bring those industries together. Um, I joke a lot that, you know, in the indie film world, you're sort of only as good as your, you know, your last success story, whereas in the technology world, you're kind of celebrated for your fail-forward approach to, you know, being a risk taker. So here I live and work in the, against the backdrop of Silicon Valley and, you know, but I'm a filmmaker and I'm supposed to be worried about getting into Sundance and my box office and, you know, my global, my global sort of footprint, you know, you know, the, you know with the sales and TV sales and all these things. Um, what it all comes down to is story as an enterprise, you know? And so wherever I get involved in a film project, I'm always looking for the different ten poles of opportunity that are about building enterprise around story. Um, so for example, right now, I just recently finished a film as a producer, which is a music documentary about the life and music of Elliot Smith. And with this film, you know, where we're creating opportunities for interaction or interactivity is actually through fan engagement, 
right? So Elliott Smith's music was wildly popular in the 90s, which was very much a pre-digital era, okay? So folks have, have content that is pre-digital that we're inviting them to scan and to submit and to share and bringing to life a whole new digital archive of content about this artist that never existed before. And that's a very sort of small kind of specialized example of kind of where you can sort of see opportunities within story, you know, to develop an interactive approach to building out your project endeavor, whatever it looks like. So I think it's really about evaluating, you know, your ideas for those opportunities. Thank you. Uh, now, on the one hand, we are definitely seeing the rise of original uh, content, and it's linear, and it's on YouTube, and there's millions and millions of views, and a huge amount of money being spent on that. Uh, and yet, YouTube, for example, enables certain tools on their platform you know, to make it interactive, to allow you to, spawn, uh, to subscribe to it, allow you to do all kinds of things. And I've watched uh, annotations over the years, and I've watched people try to experiment with that platform. And, uh, but I also see that there's a struggle uh, between there's still this need to create original content on demand. It's still compelling. We still, still tell stories in a direct manner. But I also am aware, living here and being aware of the industry, that there's this community of people, we're all disparately located, who are driven to be interactive storytellers, who, are, who need, who feel they must find a way to communicate this way. We were talking about that back there, right? Why, why are we directors? Uh, that's how I started out, right? Uh, but why are we directors? Why do we need to tell stories? But why do we need to tell interactive stories? Hmm. Why, why should... Why should we, you know, what's the goal for telling interactive stories? What's that um, need in you to do that? And how can you tell a story differently? We'll go back this way. Uh, I mean, for me, everything is a story. Life, our lives are stories. I live to tell stories, period. And this is a 360 world. Interactive is a 360 experience of a story. So for me, there's just really no other way. It's, I, as a storyteller, I, I create a story universe. There are characters within that story universe. There are a variety of different subplots within that story universe. And telling a story over multi-platform allows me to fully explore that story, that character, those arcs, share it, uh, create social media content, not just Twitter and Facebook, but actually create social media content that becomes something else. Well, so why do you need to? Why do you? Does your story need to live, live in multiple dimensions, multiple platforms? Why do you want to create something that is that complex? This is hard. It, it's totally hard. But for me, all of my ideas, all of my story ideas, they're big ideas. They they actually can only be fully realized within this space. It's not only a film. It's not only a television. It's not only a piece of music. It's actually all of it. But at the same time, when I am creating the comic book or, or if I'm creating the digital series, if you only ever experience the story within that one platform, then it's going to be the best version of that that it can be, period. You should be satisfied. It should be the best comic book you ever read, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it should inspire you, hopefully, to then venture into the other platforms where you're going to get more of it. Jason, why do you need to tell interactive stories? Well, I think it's a very powerful storytelling medium. I mean, if you look backwards, um, interactivity has been very successful. I think the Passover Seder has been a really good uh, example of interactive storytelling that's lasted uh, throughout the years. And um, I think that in terms of television, you can really... Or, or you do want to do it because you can. I mean, television for 100 years has been a monologue, but now it's a dialogue. And we have these devices that... that both receive and give. And so, you know, giving ourselves that capability, if we sat and were having a conversation and I was dominating it and doing all the talking, it would start to seem boring. And so I think that, uh, you know, we couldn't do that before, but now since we have the ability to be able to make it a conversation, I think it makes it more appealing. So it's, it's like it's there, we have to do something with it? Yeah, as, 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 as artists in the storytelling, we have to use the most powerful uh, means that we have at our disposable, uh, as at our disposal. Just if, if we were fighting a war, we'd have to use uh, the most powerful means that we could responsibly to, uh, to win the war. Thomas? Um, I, I think for me, I don't know if I need, I think is we can now, I think it's more that right now there is a lot more ways to tell a story and I think for us it's, it doesn't have to always be interactive and interactive as well doesn't mean digital. I think there's a big thing for people to, 
to, to think about interaction is a very human behavior which is to engage basically so for us a lot of the interactive projects that we do some of which I tried to show but couldn't but um, <laughs> So, like for instance, we did an interesting project with BlackBerry where the interaction came from, it was a very simple concept, which I still believe in a lot, like I think simple ideas, very well told, but it was a question of engaging the fans offline, actually in the real world, and actually kind of doing that through events, doing that through real interaction with an artist or with a piece of talent. And so for me, it's more the fact that there is so many of those opportunities around that as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, or as a creator, it's just more tools to tell stories and, and I don't think everything should be interactive. I think sometimes like right now, I think maybe specifically, you know, in this space right now, everyone's looking for a gimmick and like, oh, we, like, I, I don't quite believe in that. I think it's much more about finding the right way to tell one story and, and, and sometimes you can go much deeper, but some other stories shouldn't go deeper. Sometimes it's about fan engagement, sometimes about a new revenue stream, sometimes to prolong the experience. So I think it's not one size fits all. And I think that's the biggest thing for me right now in the content space is there isn't a solution, there isn't a formula, there isn't a way to do anything. It's about talent still and it's about about audience and I think it's about creating that the content that connects those two things so for me that's the approach that we have I totally agree with you and I think that there's something organic that comes out of the idea you know and I think that, that in the independent film world you know there's been this kind of dual track um, where there are interactive ideas at the outset you know and people get excited about that and then there's kind of marketing and distribution and engagement that can be interactive and what I noticed is and you that have to raise money yeah, and a lot of people are using intera interactivity as a way to kind of, in, you know, to fuel fundraising efforts as well. Does, but does that, does offering a, a story with interactivity attract money? It certainly can. It certainly can. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, but again, it's, it's finding something that is organic that will create a groundswell of interest and, and that may look like all kinds of things. Um, you know, I mean, well, why has crowdfunding become so vitally important for independent filmmakers? Well, because it works. You know, because you know people are raising six and seven figures, you know, on, um, through these platforms. Um, but I think that, you know, what what it provides is it's just a tool. You know, it allows people to amplify each other's voices and extend the message of whatever the goal is of what we're trying to do. Uh, in in that case, it's you know crowdfunding to fund the film. Um, but I think that what I was trying to get at before is that these. These two sides of the coin, you know, the ideas interactive in the outset versus like the marketing and engagement on the on the on the back end. It, I think that ultimately there's potential for interactivity at every phase of an idea, and it's really trusting the process that you know the way you describe that is really how I how I look at it. You have to kind of you know focus your energy where there are organic opportunities for interaction that makes sense for your story. There are some companies that, completely. There are some companies who are investing heavily in creating interactive stories. Microsoft Studios, we tried to um, to we invited Will Moselle from Microsoft Studios and he's deeply involved but he has had a family obligation. Mm. You could have met him. He's great. Uh, but you know some companies understand that that's the future. Uh, and that there's a, a financial opportunity in that. And I'm I don't know so much about independent filmmaking, but to what extent do you feel that you're getting requests to make uh, interactive content that uh, is funded or, or people want it because they want to uh, deliver ads into it? I mean, is there a business opportunity or is this really, are you driven? I mean, you're more commercial, I would say, Jason as well. I mean, you guys, to what extent is there money to do what you want to do? Well, you know, money, I think, is, is always scarce to do the projects that, that, that we feel are, are, are the most creative. I think that because we're the sort of the, the guardians of integrity that, the, you know, in any kind of project, it makes us have to, to judge those opportunities, you know, pretty carefully. Uh, what, what it does give us is an opportunity to, to do some magic and to provide delight. And so, you know, it helps in a room to be able to say, we're going to tell the story in a way that reaches people in a way that they've never been reached before. You know, when I hear about Elliot Smith's documentary, I'm a big fan of the, of the subject. And then I think how delightful to be able to see things that I wouldn't be able to find anywhere else and to, to get that kind of analog stuff together. It adds delight. And, and magic and delight are really what we bring to the table. But, I, you know, I just, I, I see that um, creating interactive content is hard. It's difficult. And yet, 
uh, everybody seems to want to create a story world, or they want to make reality shows interactive and tell a story. Or there's the we had a session. I think it's maybe it's tomorrow or Super Social, where storytelling takes place not only as a social TV experience, but it takes place in the real world. Uh, there's a platform called Conductor, uh, and they are bringing the interactive storytelling experience. Uh, to uh, with, uh, for Game of Thrones in Spain, and so you go and uh, participate in a reenactment of of Game of Thrones, but you also interact with your cell phone at the same time, and you engage and you find out before, and then you go and you experience. So storytelling is interactive, potentially immersive, but companies are taking an interest in that. Um, but the the company has to have that right vision. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interest in this, but it's still very hard. What's the well? I mean. To create any quality piece of content is, is, is always a challenge for, for, for any artist. But you know, going, going back to these particular kinds of stories that are multi-platform, it is completely organic. It starts from the, the story, the concept, the, you know, like, like for, for myself with Dark Prophet, I, the concept actually integrates, it, it, it integrates music, it integrates this underground club scene, it integrates martial arts. I mean, there are a variety of integrations just with the concept. So from there, naturally, organically, you can see how it could spill over into platforms completely organically. Um, but, you know, what some of the things that you're talking about where, uh, you know, in, with Game of Thrones, etc., one of the different factors is that the audience is no longer, no longer passive. So they're part of the process. So that creates different opportunities. And as storytellers, uh, obviously, uh, we want to be able to capitalize on that and embrace that, uh, first of all, to, you know, to, to potentially uh, uh, finance our projects. I mean, you know, for, for us as artists, as storytellers, Obviously, we need we need to create revenue to continue creating our art, our passions, our our stories. But there are just more opportunities in the marketplace where you can bring in interactivity that makes sense that people are willing to pay for. Now, as storytellers, people call you often auteurs, right? Why it's in French, I don't know. I love French, <laughs> but uh, do should we learn? Learn? Should we should we mourn the loss of the auteur. I have this conversation with many directors and, and, and good friends who are directors because I, I do a lot of interactive work that's, um, let's say, a 360 degree video um, that I did for Devo where people can choose where they're looking, you know, in, in space. And I have director friends who ask me, you know, why are you relinquishing the control of, of where people are looking? You know, you, you had the control of being able to cut to a close up for, for meaning. And, you know, for me, it's that I think of it more like directing theater or opera where you know, people look where they want to look. And so you're not really relinquishing control as an auteur, you're just uh, considering it in a different medium. And every time you work in a different medium, you're gonna use the rules of, uh, of that medium. So we're, we're really creating a new vocabulary um, of storytelling and we're not you know, shirking our, our, our duties or, or, or relinquishing control. We're just uh, using the, a new vocabulary. Thomas, uh, did, did you interact with Bob Dylan when you were creating? Unfortunately, no. Uh -huh. um, I think Yoni Block told me that he did. Yeah, Yoni did because that's that's how the, the deal happened. But I wanted to talk just a bit okay. about like the, the business side of things, about whether there's money or not. Um, I think what's quite interesting with Interactive is actually the engagement levels that you have, which effectively, uh, you know, I sat here today, I'm not from technology, I think most people in this, in this room are much more around data and understanding those things. And I think what's truly, what's actually the truth is, is, is interactive content allows you to have much deeper engagement and that is actually a way to monetize that content in a much more effective way. So of course brands are gonna try and you know, probably pay a premium for interactive content and so on. So I think there's a very much a double-edged sword because to also create truly interactive projects is a lot more expensive to create a very, very good website, a comic book, da, 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 like all of those kind of things is actually gonna probably double the budget of any piece of content. So. In one way, yes, there is more money because you have bigger engagement, but in another way, your budget is much higher too. So I, again, I think it's a question of, of understanding what is the best way to execute your project and, and who's the best financier behind it. And I think the one thing there is, 
not a very clear um, process on is who are interactive finances. Like I wouldn't be able to tell you, but I can tell you that if I create a piece of content that has, you know, three times the engagement of a, of a different piece of content, I will be able to get a brand to pay premium for that and, and so on. So I think it's just a question of understanding where that money is coming from and ultimately it's about value. And I think interactivity just allows us as content creator to deliver more value to a brand, to an audience, and that is actually financially, um, you know, very valuable. There's all, there's all, this, uh, this new opportunity for the broadcasters anyway, because they have more money, uh, to look at the, uh, the big data that's being collected and allow that to influence how they create their stories. Mm. How does the independent director uh, even get involved? Do you want to use big data? Is that an idea? Is that, um, is, because offering an uh, interactive, interactive story that collects data on how people experience that story, you know, that's a completely different form of storytelling. What do you think about? I would just say one thing. I think what would be interesting in this conference is the crossover between technology. Like, I think for us, a lot of what is kind of been talked about today uh, sounds like Chinese. So for there's a lot of mystery, I think, around data and so on that in our world doesn't exist. So I think the more collaboration there is between creatives and technology and I think and so on, I think that's when we're going to find interesting collaborations. So that's why we introduced the idea of directors and Mark was at our hackathon and Jason to, to talk to the hackers to inspire them. We're trying to do that. Go ahead. Oh, well, you know, it's a kind of building on the hackathon a little bit and kind of data and understanding kind of market relevance. You know, um, there were, so there were, uh, there was a hackathon this weekend and I was a judge and, you know, there were some brilliant prototypes and some really fun stuff that for me as a kind of consumer who enjoys technology, felt like a lot of things were kind of at least a decade off, if not 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years off, just in terms of the concept and the, the market relevance and the applicability in my daily life. And then there were a few hacks that were like, wow, I could really see this, you know, being cool and relevant right away and, and finding its place in the market. And I think that that is part of, you know, that's where data comes in is, you know, you know, I can sort of, that's like what I just shared with you was like a gut response to like what a technology offering could provide in my life. But all of you who work in data, you know, you can sort of tell us really what trends are, you know, are interesting for large numbers of people. And I think that, you know, and on the content side, we need to sort of think about that, right? What are some of the what are some of the th things that data can that we can learn from data that will inform some of the choices that we might want to try and experiment with as storytellers? To me, that feels fun, interesting, and exciting as a director to you know actually think about, you know, in the same way that I'm sure developers think about when they're building apps and other cool stuff that yeah. you know they want they want to find a place in the market. For. But the the careful line that you probably as a as an original thinker would want to find would be, you know, how do I embrace this new technology, this data? How do I uh, uh, come up with something original and, and still be part of the, re the, the real world? The, the, um, at the same time, you remove your ability to tell your story from your heart or, for, or it's an original story that you thought of. You're sort of looking at marketing data and trends and things like that. But um, it's interesting because some people would be very afraid as original storytellers especially in LA, I think, <laughs> to go there, right? Well, uh, and I, I think that that's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people who would fight against that, but yet the, the modern world is taking us in that direction. Yeah. There's I, I, be I think there's a, a number of opportunities, like, for instance, if you actually have a, a, a big data company come to you and say, okay, this is our data, we want to create an amazing story, which, which may be more of a work for hire opportunity. Right. And that's a tremendous opportunity. Why wouldn't we want to create something original with, with that data, especially if we could just m make it something that's never been seen before? That, that's just one opportunity. But then, just uh, for ourselves, stories that are near and dear to us, starting there and then looking at what big big data we can actually bring into that particular project and then bring in those brands, et cetera, and utilize that information. So, you know, I, I think that as an artist and being true to yourself, authentic, um, and, and not basically selling out, which is what you're getting to, which many artists kind of feel that way, is, uh, again, whether it's a work for hire opportunity, you can run with it and still make it your own. Well, there, or, or if it's something from your passion, then you can start with, with that concept and bring the, you know, the data folks in. There are plenty of examples where people are creating advertising. The advertisers really now want to create story experiences, right? Right. right. And so there's real money in it. And as a director, 
and you want to make a living, you need to do that. But as an original storyteller who wants to create something unique, do you go there, I guess? Well, you know, I think um, it goes back to someone very much smarter than me, Albert Einstein, uh, <laughs> said, uh, you know, a, a man who drives safely while kissing a, a girl is not thinking deeply enough about the kiss or the girl. And, uh, think about that. you know, it's, it's hard to keep your hand on the wheel and, and, and be safely. And I think as, as, uh, as directors, we're talking in television, I mean, a lot of what we want to do is keep our attention on the story. And so interactivity that, that, that distracts from the story is, you know, maybe good for a world where we maybe feel in our hearts that a lot of television is terrible. And that, there's, and that there's something that, uh, that's almost an experience of, of we want to give ourselves something fun to do while we're commenting on something on screen that we don't have a connection to. And I think that a lot of our television and flipping, you know, experience of flipping through television could be that, that kind of thing of, uh, of not connecting to television. But as storytellers, when we're working on a specific show, we want to keep the attention you know, on the story, and so the the interactivity that doesn't help that is is you know, as directors, we're supposed to stay away from that. Are there interactive stories that can be told that aren't just choose your own adventure, that aren't just uh, social TV? All of these things are valid in and of themselves, but to some extent, I feel we need to push beyond that. And what's the, what's an original interactive story on broadcast television? Well, what could that be? Can you? Yeah, well, Yoni Block has done some great work with that at Tel Aviv University. And uh, there's an idea of being able to map the, the chart of a story. You know, we, we're very familiar with this Aristotelian idea of rising to a climax in resolution. But he has something like 30 different uh, charts of how you could look at uh, an interactive story. And that works anyway from, like, if you think of do the right thing, right? It ends with, uh, with Mookie Spike Lee throwing a garbage can through, through a window. But we're looking at all the other things that happen in the city, at that, in, in the city of, of Brooklyn at that time. And uh, so, you know, you have that where it's leading to one, comp, uh, to one ending. You have another way where it's a choose your own adventure where there could be a multitude of, uh, of climaxes or endings. And you have probably 30 variations on that. Um, of what a story is. But are interactive stories just essentially game worlds? Are we just creating game, the gamification of storytelling? Or is, is, there, is there a new medium we haven't invented yet? I, I mean, a I, new way of telling stories. Well, I think there are new, many new ways of, of telling stories that are to come, certainly. I mean, you know, just listening to the, the, the wearables with the Oculus Rift, I mean, that there are many new ways Cinematic coming VR. exactly of of uh, telling stories to come more more opportunities but in terms of um, you know just commenting what what you literally were getting at the heart of which is I mean, what I think that you're saying is, are we slapping interactivity into into stories um, or is it something that is just organic natural uh, is is an experience that um, that 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 makes enhances enhances the story, or is it uh, or just uh, not gamification? So you know, I think I think the the level of interactivity and that kind of engagement, the audience gets to choose that. So they can just engage in the story from a passive experience, the way you know historically it's been. So uh, in the second screen, third screen, etc. They can uh, Twitter away, et cetera, et cetera, just that kind of engagement. Gaming, if they want to go uh, you know, down that road. Um, there are, I mean, there's a variety, a variety of different interactivity, but, but it's up to the audience of how they want to engage. So it's not, it's not just gamification. It's, it's uh, many, many options, but as a creator, you actually get to develop that from the beginning, strategize on, on those opportunities and actually let that grow because the audience, uh, they can actually um, dictate and come up with new ways that you actually didn't think about once you let them in. Well, if, if you create it that way, I mean, that, that's something that I think is interesting about where in the process you bring the interactivity in, is, is that my dream situation is when I develop it with technologists, when, I, when, when I'm able to, to create a story that uses the technology intrinsically to the storytelling. Invariably, in, in most solutions, people, technologists are developing something for every eventuality. And, uh, and I think where we as directors come in is by saying we need this one 
thing to work this way and the rest of the eventualities don't matter to us. And unfortunately, the, the process is that the technologists and, and the technological thinking and, and many of the, the people that I meet at the show come in very, very late. There's, al there's already a script, there's already characters, there's already stuff in the can, and now we're seeing, you know, how can we dial a phone to somebody while they're watching this show? And it's, uh, it's not, in those cases, a way that you, uh, that you get something that's integrated and, and, and germane to what our, our job is, which is to defend the, the story itself. I, th I think that you know, part of what I'm engaged with in my own work in this current moment, which has been sort of you know, unfolding for a few years now, is that the field is changing. And the field is sorting it out, you know, and as a filmmaker or a storyteller or however you want to refer to yourself in this conversation, the field is, we're sorting these things out in real time. And we're, you know, we're trying things, we're doing experiments, you know, we're taking risks, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, what the technology can help us to stretch to do with our stories. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that we're living and working in what I, I refer to as kind of a bridge period where there's, I, I feel like we're living and working in what I refer to as a, as a bridge period where, you know, and, and there's been a lot of sort of future conversations around like what might be possible in the next decade and, you know, what in terms of, you know, holograms and, you know, and I always say if it's not going to stand there, you know, right in front of me and I'm going to be able to make love to it, then, you know, I really don't care, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, and I, and I say that quite seriously, you know, it's like until that is sorted out, like I'm just going to keep making independent films and kind of figure out what are the appropriate ways to tell the stories I want to tell, given what technology can, you know, can provide. So in this bridge time, that's why we're all sort of, you know, doing the heavy lifting of figuring this stuff out, you know. I don't, I, I don't want to feel like this is sort of a compulsory conversation, you know, like I have to do X, Y, Z in order to package my project for funding, you know, for su su successful distribution, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I think that in this bridge time, you know, we have to cherry pick the right strategies for our projects in ways that feel authentic and will connect with audiences. And anyway. Well, actually, we're going to have to close. But the, the point that I wanted to make by having this great conversation with, uh, with people whose work I really respect uh, is that uh, there's so much to explore. We still have to keep working. The great pieces, the, the things that are historic, you know, will emerge if we keep working at it. And there are experiences where, uh, you know, you might interact with Twitter characters that don't really exist. There might, you might go into a, an immersive VR experience, but then have your iPhone and you have to go somewhere across town to finish the story. It might be something that the broadcasters do where they want you to go from platform to platform. Whatever it is, is we, ha we must, as human beings, and we must, as people who believe in the interactive television medium, we must find ways to allow the storyteller to be part of our overall experience because, you know, to, to tell a story is the most essential way that we communicate and transmit what it's like to be us human. here and human now. And uh, we don't advance as a civilization unless we do that. Let's make some money doing that, but I think that's really where the meaning is. That's where it's really fun. And I hope we will keep experimenting and uh, and trying something new in our work and, and uh, let people like this come into your life and help you uh, uh, push what you're doing a little bit further. Just, just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.